Hey, welcome everybody. It's uh, February 4th, 2012. Uh, you're viewing and listening to uh, Nerdstalker Tech Week podcast. I think it's number 20, but I, I think we're not putting the numbers in anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm Greg Valoria, a.k.a. Social Greg on Twitter, and you are? I am Adolfo Ferranda, at Nerdstalker on Twitter. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Good to see you, Greg. Hey, man. Uh, how you feeling? I Good. know you were under the weather. Yeah, yeah. I, I will hack about uh, 90% less in this episode. So uh, thanks for bearing <laughs> with me, uh, everyone. We appreciate it. Nice to see. I, yeah, I'm glad to see the old Adolfo back. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. And the new Greg <laughs> is back. New and improved Greg. Here he is, everyone. <laughs> well, nice. Greg, man, let's get into it. What do you say? You got some, some good stuff here. So what's Facebook... Uh, what Facebook's IPO means for users. What's well, you it's know, yeah, you know, IPO launched with the Uber billion, <laughs> five billion IPO this yeah. week, and uh, that was incredible, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, you know, it, you know, everyone was talking about you know in terms of from the investment side, but mm. uh, the story I, I got from uh, Cameron Scott, uh, IDG News, uh, via PC World, mm. um, you know really discussed what can they do with the money you know, mm -hmm. for, for us, the users, right? I mean, that's all we care about, right? right. So, um, you know, I think a couple of quotes they got from some of the analysts after the IPO, you know, one I thought was interesting, you know, users can see a changes in the mobile experience sooner rather than later. You know, if everyone's anyone out there, I think a lot of people are Facebook users, you notice that your mobile experience and your desktop experience are starting to kind of merge slightly. You know, they're, they're very common, you know, where they were very separate before, right? If, True. If non-existent, right? And so, you know, I think uh, this, uh, this Gardner um, analyst said that, these experiences will move together um, and be as one. Uh, another analyst mentioned that you know maybe that uh, that Facebook could challenge uh, Google in the search mm -hmm. area, which was kind of an interesting kind of right. take on it. Mm -hmm. You know, their search function isn't really that great, <laughs> yeah. but they got uh, a lot of data. It. Well, yeah. A lot of data. And, and, and the last one, uh, you know, the third one I thought out of uh, takeaway from the article was really, you know, um, you know, the, the company only gets about, you know, one on page, one in four page views on the web right now. And it guards just only 10% of the ad revenue. So they should be able to take advantage of the ad, ad revenue, I think, um, you know, by, by, by utilizing our data, I guess. Oh mm -hmm. my God, that's kind of scary. But, um, that's that's a that's an area where they can improve their financials, you know, because if you look at some of the charts, you know, they're 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 small in comparison to Google's mm -hmm. um, revenue, right? right? And so I think they need to figure out how to do that. And now being a public company or about to be a public company, they're going to mm -hmm. have to work on that a little bit, right? Wow. So they're going to be sitting on a mountain of money and be able to actually create mm -hmm. probably more products or opportunities to make money, similar to like what Google has done. You know, with uh, with other sort of types of products, man. Yeah, it'll be interesting how they integrate. I mean, you know, remember that there was that rumor last year, and maybe it is in the Facebook phone. You mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, one could wonder, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're getting awfully cozy with Microsoft, so we shall see what happens with that. Yeah. Well, let's let's move on to the next one. I think cool. uh, you have a pretty pretty cool one. Uh, the iMessage could be used as an espionage device? <laughs> yeah, right. So this one, uh, yeah, it's an accidental espionage, how iMessage conversations end up in the wrong hands. Um, this is coming from The Verge, a story by, uh, by TC uh, Sotek. Um, so apparently all these tales have surfaced recently about unsuspecting iPhone users that have had their uh, private conversations swiped by thieves or intercepted by accident uh, or or through uh, the, the Verge's own independent test, uh, they've confirmed the issue and at least one way uh, it could arise. But to be clear, this doesn't mean you should hit the panic button. They say uh, Apple representative, uh, actually an Apple representative, Natalie Harrison, tell, told them that the problem in the Gizmodo case, because Gizmodo replicated, replicated this also, is not a bug with iMessage, but rather a rare situation in which a retail employee broke protocol and used their personal SIM card to help a customer that didn't have a working SIM. Uh, but what about those who have their iPhone or SIM stolen? The issue may not mm. be 
a catastrophic bug, uh, but it's certainly a repro- uh, reproducible exploit. Uh, all you do is you take out the victim's SIM card and put it in the spy's iPhone. On the victim's phone, you'll get a no SIM installed pop up, and the and mm. the settings. Uh, you go to phone menu will be inaccessible. The phone menu will be inaccessible. But sure enough, the phone number will still be listed under iMessage. Uh, this whole issue wow. stems from the phone number staying tied to the phone's iMessage surf- service even after ejection. So the iPhone itself clearly knows the SIM is missing as exhibited by the disabled uh, phone settings. <laughs> sure. If, however, you have the SIMless iPhone and you're tired of it in a invading someone else's privacy, popping in another SIM card, and even just turning iMessage off and on should sever the ties completely. Of course, if uh, someone ever does get their hands on your iPhone, there's a whole host of other nefarious things they could do other than swipe your SIM card, right? Um, so the issue might not be deserve, might not deserve some of the hysteria that we're, we're seeing across the web right now. Uh, but it's yeah. also clearly a risk that Apple needs to address and tell them they're saying it's just one more reason to think twice uh, the next time you consider leaving your phone unattended at the bar. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> so, you, you know, what? the thing is, you know, this is, it's a really weird scenario because it requires you to actually, you know, physically get someone else's phone, take out right. their SIM card, put it in right. your, your spy phone and then put right. it back into their, their phone or not. Right. And then, uh, so it's really weird, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I it's think clearly I a bug, we'll, but it's, it's an we'll odd We'll see thing. that on the next mission impossible. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's one of those where you get someone's keys and you press it in the clay and then you return it back into their pocket. You know what I mean? And you make the copy of the key. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really involved, you know? Yeah. yeah. I don't it's really exactly like care that, to read Greg's Greg's messages all that much about, you know. Oh, God. Please yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, bad spelling and all. Right, right. His new baseball hats or something like that, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, Greg, man, uh, how Google, yes. next story, how Google is on the way to take over the higher ed market. Now, this sounds like yeah. a, a fascinating story. This is great. I, I, you and I discuss education a lot on this podcast as well as, well as offline you know, mm-hmm. for a variety of reasons. And, you know, we follow a lot of channels and read a lot of channels that have to do with that. And uh, Jeremy Avaris of uh, Social Media Today wrote an, a, a great article pointing to really an original article from Felix Salmon <laughs> of Reuters, um, which discusses this, um, you know, professors just who did a mind-blowing experiment last year. And I think we talked about this, right? Remember the free education from Stanford that was given online? Yeah, right, right. Well, it came out of that. Um, It it was cool. Um, So uh, from the Digital Life uh, Conference, DLD conference, uh, Sebastian um, yeah, Thrun um, actually discussed this. He was Hmm. one of the world's professors. Oh, wow. Um, And he's with Stanford and Google. Wow. And... uh, they offered, you know, an online class in artificial intelligence, which really was the parallel class of that the one same one taught at Stanford. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, unexpectedly, they got like, get get this, a hundred and sixty thousand students wow. from around the world registered. That's incredible. And um, and so they couldn't handle the the flow. They had to set up a dedicated server and website. Ah, okay. Oh my God! So, so you know, the 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 post from actually Reuters, which uh, we'll put up on our backstories. Um, we'll talk about that later. Um, you know, you had students from Afghanistan. Um, you know, you know, <laughs> through the war zone. You know, just logging on for that one hour just to get wow. the lecture. Wow. Uh, Lithuania was uh, highly represented, I think. Um, and so. Uh, mm. And and one of the funny backstories to this was that they mentioned in the article that the Stanford class, which was the same class, dwindled from 200 students down to 30. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> Because the the online course they felt was more intimate and better at teaching than the real world course. Oh so, wow. Yeah, yeah. So so I think this is now a shift. Now now what these guys did was they created this new university online, uh, Udacity. I don't know. Is that right? Uh, I go oh, uh, Udemy or something like that. Oh right, right, sorry, Udemy. I, yeah, yeah, Udemy. Yeah, Udemy. however you pronounce that. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. So, so you know what? What this guy did is that you know he said, oh, "God, this is so successful. I'm going to actually give up my tenure at Stanford." Can you imagine that? Wow. He gave up his tenure Holy at Stanford. Smokes. Now, 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 
why um, why the why social media today connected Google and this? It, it was a kind of a weak connection, but just because that um, the professor uh, Sebastian Thrun mm-hmm. was a is a Google employee actually. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know there is a, a a soft implication there that you know can can Google help this guy. You know, since Stanford was unable to do it, you know, think about it, right? Right. Stanford put millions and millions of dollars into that New York um, campus recently, right? Right, right. Right. And so a lot of people are talking on Twitter and and the web saying, like, what's up with this? You know, it almost seems like Stanford didn't want to help this guy. And I don't know if that's true or not, but it it does beg the question, Hmm. right? Yeah. So – I mean, I think, you know, with the social world we're in, right, as you and I know, the, all the boundaries are now knocked down, and why not in education? Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at the really interesting well, – one of the many interesting parts of this is just the, the sheer demand for people to want that higher education, you know. Um, right. They're just starving for it. Look at that. Look at that. The popularity. I, you know, we're really at the cusp of, the, I think, of this education explosion, uh, especially mm-hmm. in this digital age, you know, mm-hmm. and we're on the forefront. We get to watch this. You know, you and me, we're, we're seeing we're seeing all this uh, innovation in, in this field and people trying new things. And if this guy is willing to leave, you know, Stanford and leave the comfort of tenure in order to pursue yeah. something that's, yeah. you know, clearly has a traject- one of those like hockey stick trajectories, you know, um, yeah. there, there's something happening here. And, and I'm glad you brought this up because it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I thought we had to mention that on the podcast because I think, you know, there, the, everything kind of got washed away with, with Facebook and, you know, a couple of other things that happened on Twitter and stuff like that. But um, mm-hmm. I, I thought this was kind of a lot more impacted to the world in terms of education yeah. and, and just our, you know, moving forward with the world, right? right, right. So, so, cool. Now, on cool. to an even uh, more important story, a party bus. Well, yeah, I, I, I saw that. I was like, uh, wait, wait a minute. Is he Thanks for topping to me, me Greg. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. But but I, I was interested in that because I actually I thought that was, was this is kind of interesting. You could ride a bus to South by Southwest? <laughs> yeah, so they're calling this thing uh, Startup Bus. And uh, thanks to Swiss Miss for this story, I, I stumbled upon it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so start a putch, bus, you got to imagine this. It's you and a team of strangers on a bus traveling at 60 miles an hour. Uh, have You got t- 72 hours to conceive and build and launch a startup. Uh, nice. That's startup bus in a nutshell, right? So startup bus began life as, as a joke, really, you know, because it sounds crazy. It's a, it was a road trip starting in San Francisco with friends, but with the twist of launching a startup on arrival in Austin in time for, South, for the South by Southwest Technology Conference. Um, Coming up. Somehow, though, people thought uh, Elias Biz- Bizans, the founder, was actually cool. serious. A few unexpected blog articles and emails later, and he was stuck with having uh, to now make good on his uh, pub night promise. Uh, Startup <laughs> Bus has, a, has since evolved uh, into a competition and grew sixfold with buses departing from San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Chicago, Cleveland, New York, and Miami. Uh, in Whoa. 2011, an impressive 156, quote, buspreneurs, <laughs> that was probably my favorite part of this whole story, uh, participated who produced 38 different products. Um, so, it, you know, it's it's one of those fun type of ideas of innovation and just another mm. sort of in the spirit mm. of entrepreneurship and, and this, you know, this type of thing that's happening. So, it, you know, fun thing. <laughs> no, you know, I, I thought I thought you were, I thought it was going to be a tie into that like ship we mentioned in one of the earlier podcasts that was going to be for someone in 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 visa problems. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right, the island, yes, the island of H one B, yeah, where, yes, where it's not yes, needed. Yes. <laughs> so I, I I thought that was great. I, I thought it was just innovative, like you said. Yeah, so, yeah, it's fun. Any any way that we can make a uh, new stuff in innovation, entrepreneurship, have it. I'm all for it. So, Greg, oh, man, man, feds, yes. the feds, They speaking oh. of downers, feds sees uh, 307 sports domains ahead of Sunday's Super Bowl? Yeah, well, we killed the sofa, wow. right? But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Homeland Security. But it still works. Still <laughs> yes. So, uh, Andrew uh, Tarantola from Gizmodo kind of uh, wrote a really good piece on um, just 
this inf- informational piece on you know the feds recently seized 307 sports domains ahead of Sunday Super Bowl and you know it's coming up Super uh, Super Bowl Sunday is tomorrow right um, so I thought this was a good piece to kind of mention um, so you know the Department of Homeland Security stepped up its conf confiscation of sports related domains in the run up to uh, Sunday's match tomorrow, uh, nuking about uh, 307 separate sites. So the seizures were part of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Project, you know, operation in our sites. And um, and on the site, uh, I, ICE Director John Morton uh, had had this uh, lecture uh, to all of us. While most people are focusing on whether the Patriots or Giants will win on Sunday, we at ICE have our sights on a different type of victory, defeating the international counterfeiting rings that illegally profit from this event, the NFL, its players, and sports fans. In sports, players must abide by the rules of the game, and in life, individuals must follow the laws of the land. Our message is simple. Abiding by intellectual property rights laws is not optional. It's the law. <laughs> I nice. thought that was kind of weird, but okay. Um he got his point across, uh, you know, and a lot of these things are, are you know, are of course illegitimate, right? I mean, they're, yeah, they're totally streaming, not. they're streaming, you know, uh, copyrighted events and all this stuff. And, and well, one thing to note, actually, you know, since we went to this new, you know, internet structure, it was the first uh, .tv seizure, actually. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so I thought that was kind of um, important and interesting uh, note Jeez. in this article. I love that. Um, he, so, how he just comes out and says, follow, you have to follow the rules. <laughs> yeah, stay within the lines, you know. But that is that is interesting, you know, uh, despite this, this is, I think, another example where you just don't need SOPA, right? Because you have all these right. other tools to, like, crush, crush people with, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, it, it pales in comparison now. You know? right, right, right. I mean, you know, it, I mean, look what know, they did they, to Mega Upload, right? So, yeah, yeah, you know, and exactly, I, you know, and and let's put it this way, right? I mean, these the the people on the fence are going to be deterred by this ones, but the people who really want to do it are going to find another way to do yeah, it, and yeah. so they have to go chase these guys right. completely. So I, right, I right. think that we we need to go figure that out. Okay, so let's go to the next uh, article yeah, or tweet I saw you uh, put out this week. Um, Apple and iBooks authoring, there's a clarification that we need? Or... Yeah, so a huge story, as we all know, that Apple recently released uh, Author, right? Or iAuthor, whatever uh, they call it. Um, a huge, 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 I think, uh, it, thing that's been released that I don't think the media has really grasped or the world yet yeah. has really grasped this is important. But one of the things, uh, thanks to the Next Web and Matt, Matthew Panzarino, uh, who wrote this story, is uh, a lot of people were worried about the, the user agreement, right? And there were, there were all these clamorings about, you know, Apple, like, taking ownership. If you write a book, Apple owns it and all this stuff. So, <clears throat> yeah. so what Apple's done in the story here is this, the changes to the EULA clarify that Apple does indeed intend the package product to be stolen sold on the iBook store only but also makes it clear that it does not lay claim to the content that you use to create the book nor does it try to limit what you can do with that content elsewhere um so what what they did is they said they took a closer look at Apple's recently released authoring tool uh, just after it was released. Uh, subsequent to the release, much was said about the terms and conditions, right? So all those concerns, you know, some said that it was uh, the terms were unfair or even dangerous to soft, software rights. Uh, this change in wording uh, should make it clear, as many might uh, many right minded people have assumed, that Apple was never interested in limiting the distribution of the content. Uh, that was not packaged in the iBooks format, right? So they want iBooks stuff to be, of course, in iBooks, right? And if it's not packaged in iBooks format, they don't care. Uh, the wording yeah, of the right. original was taken by some to mean that Apple was trying to exercise the rights on all kinds of content, including universal formats like PDF, not just iBooks. Uh, the EULA still includes language that indicates users are free to distribute iBooks formatted documents free of charge by any means they choose. Uh, they just can't charge for them anywhere else so uh when it's you know the thing what they're saying essentially is that if it's an ibooks format yeah of course you know it's going to stay in our it's a proprietary thing right but as you own mm-hmm. the content this is your stuff but um if it's if you output it in some other format we don't care right yeah it's that's your priority yeah a lot of people were talking i saw a little bit of tweets on that and 
yeah, I saw some people really kind of up in up in arms with some of the wording, but I'm glad they kind of reclarified some of that. But the but the the iBooks thing is kind of an interesting technology I mean, or interesting product, like you said, that that Apple's brought up brought out with. It allows you to kind of you know create your own content. Which yeah, is nice, right? yeah. The emphasis. I mean, you know, Alex Lindsay really really put a had a good spin on this too uh, from Pixel Core. Mm. He uh, he said, you know, they're they're pitching this sort of as a, a textbook, a scholastic textbooks kind of thing, right? But in reality, the the implications of this are huge in the enterprise and in business for things like um, user manuals, internal sort of training documents, and that and that kind of stuff, oh, right? How things wow. operate, right? Your product, your widget, right? Of this and that, you, it can be completely interactive, video, and it's all super easy. I mean, if you know Keynote and Pages, you essentially that's author, right? And and right. it outputs into iPad native format. It's, I mean, it's oh, nice. awesome, awesome nice. Well, with like I mean, very little need for a developer. I mean, then, then that's the PDF killer, right? Yeah, yeah, it, absolutely. There you go. Yeah, I mean, it's much more right. interactive. Makes a lot of sense. You get all these visual things: your three D modeling, your videos, your pictures, drag and drop pictures, and everything looking really great. Um, yeah, I, I think this is gonna uh, this or something like this, this is the beginning of of something much, much, much bigger. So wow, well, yeah, yeah I, I, th that's exciting. I, I think uh, let's keep an eye on that this year and see how much um, you know how much people take to it. I think I think like you said, I, I like that like that take that that person said on that. So it's good. Well, another cool uh, integration here is your next story here. Your next laptop could have Connect built in. Yes, yes, that yes. Sounds cool. Well, this is kind of a follow in the one of our podcasts. I believe was number nine. We kind of I I, I pointed p people to a, almost what was like a tip to the Microsoft video kind of like a roadmap, right? Where you could see a lot of people you know waving their hands on the device and stuff like that. Well, you know this week or the last couple of weeks, um, you know Microsoft is you know kind of announced through. Um, I think um, Matt Rosoff of SAI Tech Blog, you know, Business Insider, um, mentioned that uh, Microsoft is testing laptops with built-in Connect sensors, uh, which will allow users to control them with voice commands and gestures. And so that's really the the, the, ex, the starting of the execution of the game changers that we had talked about that Microsoft needs to become competitive again now whether it, it happens or not you know it's up to the market but you know the daily was the one that kind of broke the story on that they saw a couple of prototypes and i believe there were probably asus uh laptops um that uh that were that were confirmed to have this type of technology and, and, and microsoft confirmed to the daily that this these prototypes were indeed real so you know, Microsoft last November said that it was building Connect support into Windows, right? To able to see objects as close as about 40 centimeters uh, away. But it sounded like it was going to be an external device, not right. something that was actually built in. But now, you know, if, if the hardware guys could get a hold of this technology, um, you know, they could probably do some interesting things with it yeah that's cool i mean there's been all kinds of hacks with connect right now if you can yeah miniaturize mm. it and put it in different devices mm. like that mike yeah geez how cool would that be well <clears throat> remember now it, you know it goes from a um you know let's go way back you know a mouse pointing device to now touch to right. now maybe gestures right Gesture, i yeah. mean that's that's the that's the next thing right right, I right. Mean, well, I, I would say it's like voice gesture, actually, right now. Yeah, 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 yeah possibly. You're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. With the, with the advent gesture. of Siri and Connect yeah. together, I mean that that's a that's a, a hell of a one-two punch. Yeah. Yeah, I mean because I think you know you and I would say uh, TV on, uh, microwave on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, what what's this about uh, Foursquare and their uh, crummy check-in experience? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this one comes from a uh, Business Insider. Thank you, Business Insider, and the writer is Allison Chantel for this story. Um, <clears throat> one of the founders there, uh, last name Raynert at uh, Foursquare, assured us. Uh, uh, assured them that auto check-ins are on the way. That's been like for years they've been saying this, that, you know, I'm finding myself more and more using Facebook, um, Foursquare less and less too. I used to be yeah, obsessed yeah. about it, you know, and then just kind of tapered off, you know. And uh, one of the things is, yeah, it, it is difficult and this kind of thing. Well, I'll, I'll read you part of the story here. Part of the holdup for the uh, for the auto check-ins has been technical restraints and some of it uh, has, has been designed, says Rainer. He says uh, Radar, is what they're calling it, is just the beginning of Foursquare's auto check-in initiative. Uh, Radar is a Foursquare feature that launched a few months ago. It sends notifications uh, whenever a user walks near a venue with a deal. 
Foursquare is working uh, to broaden that technology to the entire check-in process. Eventually, Foursquare will ask you if you want to check in somewhere rather than making the user nice. remember uh, his or her own like preference there. Foursquare, Raynert says, uh, has always carefully weighed uh, the, quote, opt-in-ness, and uh, that's something that they need to figure out with auto check-ins. Um, users will never be forced to automatically check in on Foursquare, and the future improved product will make it obvious that you still don't have to tell the world where you are if you if you don't want to. But the check in proce- process he promises will be much simpler. So again, you know, we're we're hearing you know the same promise kind of thing, you know, of this sort of like automatic check in. It's it's not quite there yet. Um, of course, you got to be careful about automatically opt in people people into stuff um, yes so they're yes, kind of absolutely. stuck between a you know a rock and a hard place here because um as i stated from the beginning i'm really losing interest in in foursquare and having to do something again i'm already updating my path my you know facebook my yes, yes you know my yes. twitter and and this and that and this and that and um I don't know, uh, location stuff in, in uh, Facebook and in Google Plus and et cetera is becoming more and more just easier sort of to use as well. And I don't know that I'm all that all that uh, interested in, in, uh, in uh, the checking in process anymore. You know, you know the, only, the only reason I use it is, is really when I go to maybe lunch and I, I will look for a deal. Hmm. You know, hmm. um, that's the only reason I would do it. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I thought if there was some kind of group on Foursquare's um, kind of collaboration that yeah. we could actually, you know, do something a little bit better than that. Hmm. Um, See, uh, I, 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 I like getting my deals at, at time of purchase. So for something like a level up where you get like a 2D barcode on your phone and you just got it, got buy it. your thing like that and you have already and you get your discount, right? As opposed got to it, having to check it. in and then look, oh, there's a deal here. And then, look, I got a deal here. I'm mayor of, you know, yeah. whatever. And then the guy is squinting. Oh, yeah, yeah, what is this? And then meanwhile, you got 11 people behind you at, at noon at lunchtime <laughs> yeah, going, on. who's come this on, jackass dude. with their, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> claiming they're the mayor of what? What? Yeah, mayor? Yeah, yeah. S- saving 40 cents? What yeah. the heck's that? <laughs> Shut up, Mayor McCheese. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so I thought that that was that was good. I, <laughs> I, I think Foursquare is, is kind of in trouble. I mean, you, you think about it, right? Uh, uh, Facebook b- bought Goala, mm-hmm. right? Right, and right. with all that five billion of whatever you know, whatever cash they got out of that, um, I'm sure they're going to do something with Go Wall. Yeah, right? yeah. A little bit of so, yeah, the sheen taken off of a uh, Foursquare there, a little luster gone. Yeah. So tip time, tip time, tip yeah, time, tip, tip time, time, tip time. Why don't you lead us in with the first tip, my friend? <laughs> all right, all right. I will jump ahead of you here. Uh, yes. Looks like we both have a couple of Drippler tips here. So thanks to Drippler yes. for these great leads. Uh, my tip, uh, since you know Valentine's Day is sort of right around the corner here, Yay. and everyone keeps reminding us about this stuff. Uh, uh, Drippler led me to a really great deal where uh, you can download Touch Note postcards free for Android. Um, so what you do is you go to uh, www.touchnote.com, and uh, actually Touch Note is a, a really interesting sort of application. It's one of those you take a photograph and it auto generates a postcard, and you can actually that po- that postcard can be mailed to anyone. Uh, mm. So if you're in Europe, for instance, oh, and cool. you want to mail you know someone in the U.S., what's cool about it is that they're they're in the U.S., so they'll mail it directly from the U.S. as opposed to mail it all the way from Europe to to here in the u.s oh, wow. you know kind of thing so That's cool. you could save some money doing that which is really cool and um this is a really nice interface they have this available also for the ios for the iphone and for the ipad i believe and the touch nice. obviously so check them out thanks to dripler for that lead um uh, let's see you can yeah zoom rotate do all the usual really neat stuff with the your pictures that you could you sort of come to expect with these mobile applications and uh yeah, and what they're saying is make lovely birthday, Valentine's, or I love you postcards. Nice. So I'm showing my soft side here, uh, Greg, instead yeah. of my, my typical macho iron side that I usually show. <laughs> wow, you're you're bringing a tear to me. <laughs> yeah. So, Greg, how about your tip, your Drippler tip? Oh, yeah, I got a Drippler tip also. Um, so I phonography, uh, instead of photography, if you didn't catch that pun, uh, <laughs> but accessories I'm... from Adorama's uh, <laughs> new iPhone tool shed. So I don't know if everyone's familiar with Adorama, but they're, they're, they're one of the biggest retail uh, photo and electronics retailer in, in, in the nation. Mm. Uh, but, um, you know, as we know, the iPhone has become, uh, you know, uh, uh, ubiquitous. Uh, mm. Uh, a camera on on the earth um i think a lot of people have written how well the eight megapixel camera on the 4s has been doing 
and uh, doing some comparisons on videos uh, mm-hmm. as I saw on HD. And, um, you know, I think it's it, it's time that we get accessories for it. And I, I bought a couple of accessories for my phone too. But um, so what Autorama has done, they, they want to make uh, uh, life a little bit better from the accessory standpoint for the iPhone users who really use their phone for videos and, and photographs. Okay. So they, they created an app uh, called the iPhone Toolshed. And it, it offers exclusive uh, selection of some of the best accessories for picture taking uh, with the iPhone. Awesome. So uh, I, I thought that was really uh, – that's a good tip for everyone out there because I think, you know, how many times have you said, okay, uh, you, I need to balance my phone somewhere. I need to find someone just like a regular camera, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. if you could get a tripod for it or, you know, something that will hold it up so you could take a phone, a, a picture with your phone, I, I thought that was kind of cool. So they have a bunch of things like that. Um, Great. You know, uh, so, you know, catch that. We'll put that on the backstories, and I'll talk about that a little later, how you can catch a lot of our links and everything. But right. uh, that's that's my tip of the week, my friend. Thanks, man. <laughs> hey, next event, what's happening? Oh, SF New Tech, uh, February 15th. Uh, we got the Chinese coming, so it's going to be China cool. night, China Tech night. Oh, uh, that'll be interesting. With, yeah, with Tianji. Well, Really, what Tianji is is it, it was uh, it's Via Deo, uh, which it, which it acquired in uh, 2007. Oh, it's right. really China's number one professional social network with over eight million members. Wow. Um, so it helps you connect with potential clients. So it's basically a LinkedIn, you know, mm-hmm. a clone in a way. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, because LinkedIn doesn't work there. Oh. Uh, but but uh, you know. Uh, I think that um, they'll have a really good selection of about six startups. I, I, I think Dolphin will be there. Oh, cool. Uh, which, yeah, the, they've localized in Chi- Chinese. Um, so there's going to be some pretty nice uh, nice startups that you'll see there. Yeah, and don't forget that you can contribute to our stories too, please, uh, on Twitter. All you have to do is do a, add a little hashtag to your to your link, uh, NRDSTK, and we will definitely add your story to the to the list. And uh, check us out, our, all of our work at uh, nerdstalker.com, or check, you know, subscribe to us at iTunes, uh, either the audio podcast or the video please. podcast, uh, and give us a rating. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. Uh, and on YouTube, you can do a search for Nerd Stalker TV, all one word, Nerd Stalker TV, and you will see our YouTube channel. And yes. um, yeah, and, so and catch our backstories on uh, ah. Storify.com, Social Greg, uh, where I post the links to original articles and comments that uh, and in and stuff. So I, I think, well, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of excited about trying to add to our broadcast. So yeah. that's another way you could add to our broadcast. So, so Greg, how do they get a hold of you directly? You can find me at Social Greg on Twitter at Social Greg, or you could email me at Social Greg SF at gmail dot com. And you, for, uh, my friend uh, Adolfo Ferranda, call me Fonzie. Um, you Fonzie. can reach me on Twitter at Nerdstalker, or you could email me Adolfo at Nerdstalker dot com. Hey, thanks, Greg. Been a been All a right, great uh, another great show. Okay, <laughs> I don't be say careful so out there.